Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. I hope everyone is having a happy new year, and I'm wishing perfect health and happiness to everyone within the sound of my voice. Today, we're going to talk a bit about alternate internets. In previous episodes, we have outlined how, going back to the 1970s and 80s, early experiments with networked computing and online services began using a technology called videotechs. These experiments were mostly run, in North America at least, by newspapers and print media companies. But it turns out that they were inspired by other earlier experiments that first took place in Europe. So I wanted to dig deeper into these experiments to look at them as valuable precursors to the World Wide Web and the modern internet as we know it today. It's unlikely, for various technical reasons, that a technology like Videotechs could have evolved network systems that would have challenged the modern TCP IP internet as we know it, but it's fun nonetheless to explore these other systems and imagine an alternate net that we might have come to know and love. And most interesting, to me at least, this exercise will allow us to examine Minitel, the French video text network that grew to prominence a full decade before the World Wide Web. So, what was video text? Well, it was actually based on a similarly named technology called teletext. Teletext delivered text, as well as simple geometric shapes and mosaic blocks of color to be displayed on a television screen. The text and data were sent via the -the over-the-air broadcast signal and decoded on a television set configured with a mechanism called a DBI encoder. Teletext was a way of delivering data like news or weather or financial information to a television screen. Importantly, teletext was one-way communication only. It was not interactive. But it was inspired technology nonetheless, because teletext could be continually and instantly updated. In essence, it was the first serious attempt to broadcast the written word, just as sound and images have been broadcast for decades. The first work on this technology was actually done in Britain in the 1960s. Around 1970, the BBC in Britain was looking for ways to deliver closed captioning for their television broadcasts. They seized upon teletext technology as the way to do this and realized that if they continued to build out the teletext technology fully, they could also deliver an entire secondary service of information channels. In 1972, the concept was first made public under the name CFAX, and it went beyond closed captioning to the fully realized vision of multiple continually updated channels of information sorted by topic or interest. Teletext, in the form of CFAX and later others, was actually quite successful in the UK, as both the BBC and the IBA provided hundreds of pages of data dedicated to news, sports, etc., and even carrying advertising in the case of the non-BBC content. If you listen to episode 89 of this podcast, where Tom Hadfield described founding SoccerNet at a young age, you might remember that he was getting all of his sports scores by tuning into CFAX, where the sports scores were regularly updated and he transcribed them to the web. CFAX and a similar service called Oracle developed information pages for the better part of 30 years, and the services were copied widely by television providers throughout Europe. 
CFAX was continuing to provide information pages over television airwaves right up until 2012 when British television finally made the switch to fully digital services. So that was teletext, text and data over the television airwaves. Let's turn now to video text, which was completely inspired by teletext, but it was designed to do a similar thing in a slightly different way. Again, the idea was to deliver limited data and text to a television set or a dedicated terminal. But video text, as opposed to teletext, delivered this data via wired lines, like normal telephone lines or lines similar to modern coaxial cables. The key difference, again, was that these wires allowed for two-way communication. So with video text, as opposed to teletext, along with receiving information, you could interact with the information, thereby enabling activities such as banking, library research, airline reservations, theater ticket purchases, and even electronic mail. The British General Post Office, which would soon become British Telecom, had been researching concepts around video text since, again, the late 1960s. The General Post Office would release its teletext product as a commercial service in 1979 and called it Prestel. Prestel was based on the work of Samuel Fedita at the then post office research station in Martlesham, Suffolk. Fedita's vision was that since most UK households already had televisions and they already had telephone lines, He foresaw a world where information providers would store data on central computers and download, or upload, I suppose, that data to decoders, which would then display the information on users' televisions. The UK Post Office slash British Telecom loved this idea. They convinced TV manufacturers in Britain to build sets with the view data encoders necessarily built in, And after a brief trial, they launched the Prestel service to consumers for a smallish monthly fee. It turned out, though, that Prestel was not a success. By March of 1982, there were only about 14,000 users of Prestel in the UK, of which 85% were businesses and only 15% were private homes. The original forecast for the Prestel service, had envisioned a total of 700,000 subscribers by this point, and they had originally imagined that the ratio of home-to-business users would be completely reversed. The reason for the small uptake of Prestel, I think, is the familiar chicken-and-egg problem of any software or data platform. How do you incentivize developers, or in this case content providers, to develop content for said platform. In this case, with so few users, those information providers that Samuel Fedita had envisioned seeding his system with news, weather, and sports information actually had little incentive to invest much time in creating content. And of course, with little in the way of content, why would people be interested in paying for and subscribing for this data? Another problem was simply one of timing, because Prestel came out at the exact same time that VCRs and personal computers were just becoming available to consumers in Britain. And so in the competition to sell a new consumer electronic technology to British households, it simply was that Prestel was coming in a distant third. So whereas the BBC succeeded with teletext, because it was just a useful add-on to your existing television service, British Telecom failed with its Prestel video text because it was a complicated new technology. The Prestel service actually limped along, mainly serving business subscribers, until 1994, when the service was finally shuttered. So, video text failed in Britain. But across the channel, it was a different story. In France, the government took a different tactic toward the 
development of the technology that actually allowed video text to take off. The French government in the 1970s was making concerted efforts to invest heavily in what it saw as leading-edge technologies. This was the era of the Concorde and the high-speed TGV trains. And so around this time, France was also investing heavily in its telecommunication system, which today, I'm told, is considered to be one of the most sophisticated in Europe. The French looked to the video text experiments in Britain and saw another way to leap to the cutting edge of telecommunications technology. The system the French developed was called Minitel, and it did video text a bit differently. For one thing, Minitel was designed to be used on a separate, dedicated terminal, not just your television. This actually turned out to be a good thing because then instead of taking over your TV, your TV was still there to do its thing in the background while the eventual Minitel service would be available on a terminal that was there when you wanted to use it. The second way the French did things differently was that they got around the whole chicken and egg thing of seeding the market completely. The French government gave you your Minitel terminal for free. When the service rolled out in 1982, French telephone users were given the choice between receiving a regular, old, ordinary paper phone book or a brand new Minitel terminal, which was probably worth hundreds of francs. And the terminal came with the complete phone book, both white and yellow pages, fully accessible on it. The Minitel terminal was marketed as a glorified telephone directory, but it was a directory that would never be out of date. And of course, again, it was free, so many hundreds of thousands of French households took up the Minitels in the first couple years they were available. Once they switched the Minitel terminals on, they eventually found that there could be more there than just a phone directory. With the backing of the state and massive government investment behind it, the first French governmental and academic institutions, but later private enterprises and businesses as well, invested serious resources in creating applications and services for the terminals. Hundreds and then thousands of separate services sprang up for Minitel. And it was more than just headlines and sports scores. Again, because... Teletext was a fully interactive technology. Eventually, using your Minitel, you could make train reservations, you could check stock prices in near real time, get customized weather reports, send and receive email, and even do nearly real time chat like we do on our phones and on the web today. You could do actual banking. You could apply to universities and check your test scores. You could even conduct commerce and order products from catalog companies. Crucially, because Minitel was run by the phone company, people had little trouble trusting the system to transact business. Publishers could even charge small fees to read articles or content using Minitel as an intermediary. As you'll recall, for a long time, commerce on the early World Wide Web was quite slow to grow because people feared putting their credit card numbers online. And so it's fascinating to realize that Minitel cracked the problem of micropayments to content publishers, something that the larger internet still hasn't solved. In place of the URL structure that we're familiar with on the web, each Minitel service had a separate number, sort of like a phone number, that you keyed in in order to go to the service you wanted to use. That is why, uh, long before www and .com started showing up in ads, in France, going back to the 80s, you would see 3615 numbers on billboards encouraging you to look up a service on Minitel. Again, it functioned similar to how a URL worked. Each company or service would register on the 3615 system. Then to access that company or service, you typed in the 3615 number on your terminal, followed by the name of the company or service. 3615 services were preceded by 
3613 services and 3614 services. The analogy would be that those were the equivalent .org or .gov for websites. When in February 1984, the so-called kiosk system was created, the 3615 services were intended to be commercial and thereby became the equivalent to the webs.com sites. Again, they were commercial, and so you paid by the hour. I'm told 60 francs, about 9 euro per hour, paid by the user, but that included about 6 euro, uh, 40 francs at the time, for the service, and then 20 francs, or 3 euro, would go to France Telecom's cut. So roughly two-thirds of the hourly fee went to the service provider, and one-third went to France Telecom. The rise of these 3615 commercial services exploded the number of apps and services on Minitel, with total applications rising from 145 in 1984 to a little over 2,000 in 1985, around 5,000 in 1987, and fully 25,000 by 1996. So in a way, the revenue model that Minitel developed was similar to how early AOL worked in North America, but sort of mashed up with what would become the web. And in this case, again, the revenue from using the service was split between France Telecom and whatever developer created a service. This was apparently very lucrative. By 1996, those commercial services represented nearly a billion euro in income. And as late as 2007, shortly before the Minitel system was beginning to be retired, it still generated well over 100 million euro a year for France Telecom and its publishing partners. In total, it's estimated that about 10,000 companies of various sizes created almost 26,000 different services for Minitel over the life of the service. If this all sounds a bit like the web, or what the web would become, that's sort of because it was, albeit minus the graphics and extensibility that we're used to with the modern web. The Minitel system was text-based only. It was black and white. And though emulators were developed for personal computers later on, the Minitel devices were not PCs. They were dumb terminals with no local storage. You could only access information and interact with the database. There was no downloading, and there was also, crucially, no search. But a lot of the things that proved popular on the early web also proved popular on Minitel. Eventually, a plethora of message boards and community bulletin board systems sprung up to cater to every interest under the sun. It turns out that just as on the web and every other networking technology subsequently, the most popular application was simply allowing people to talk to each other. Long before blogging, there were essentially chat lines on Minitel where people could commiserate about current events, and there even evolved an abbreviated Minitel language shorthand, similar to the texting abbreviations like LOL or FTW that we are familiar with today. An example I was able to find reads like this. Sati ki, which was short for salu ki es tu, or hello, who are you? Just as with the web, sex helped sell Minitel. And again, just as like AOL, once people discovered they could interact with each other, the most popular way of interaction on Minitel were services that were known as Le Minitel Rose. Essentially, these were professional, dirty chat services, the equivalent to North America's 1-900 numbers from the 1980s and 90s, except all the erotic stuff was going on over keyboards. It is estimated that by 1990, the Rose Red Light District of Minitel represented fully 50% of all calls. There's a great episode of the podcast Reply All, which is episode 10, titled The French Connection, 
where a young student who worked at one of these Minitel Rose services as an animatrice is interviewed. It's an excellent uh, episode, and if you want to learn more about living the professional Minitel Rose lifestyle, I highly recommend downloading that episode. France Telecom considered Minitel to be a rousing success. In fact, by the time Tim Berners-Lee was just coding up the first World Wide Web pages in 1989, there were already 5 million Minitel terminals in use in France, and the service was generating almost 500 billion francs in revenue every year. In total, 9 million terminals were distributed to the French public, and an estimated 25 million people used the service at its height. But of course, the internet and the web would come along in the 1990s, and of course the web could do everything Minitel could do, but also much, much more. It helped that the web was international and freewheeling and sort of anarchical, whereas Minitel decidedly was not. Sources I read for this episode maintain that web adoption was much slower in France than it was elsewhere in Europe or in North America, largely because the existing popularity of the Minitel system led to a certain inertia in adoption. And if this is true, I suppose that would be understandable. If I was a Minitel user in 1995 and you told me about what the web was, sight unseen, I would probably be like, well... I already have that, and I would have pointed to my Minitel terminal. Again, having never used the service myself, and not being familiar with the French technology industry in general, I'm relying on secondary sources here, but the sources claim that the reasons why Minitel would eventually lose out to the web were not entirely technical. France did attempt to export the Minitel system abroad, But except for Belgium, they found little success. And the sources say that one big reason for this seems to have been that the French government tried to sell Minitel terminals overseas in other countries like Ireland and the U.S. And note that I said sell. Remember, giving away the terminals had been the key to the system's uptake in the first place in France. And so it seems that the French had forgotten the lesson that they had learned about seeding the marketplace. Also, according to the sources, a bit of culture and bureaucracy seems to have been a hindrance here as well. Minitel was very much a closed platform. Forget open source, if you wanted to introduce a new app or system on Minitel, you had to apply to do so. I don't want to wade here into the weeds of the whole Gallic versus Anglo-Saxon worldview, But I am going to quote now from an article from the BBC. Quote, Indeed, the whole Minitel adventure can be seen as a typical French experience. Only in France could the public resources have been mobilized to give the project its initial boost. So for a few years, the country was the envy of the world. But then, immobility and inertia, as the market simply passed by. The failure of Minitel was not one of technology, says Benjamin Bayard, head of France's oldest internet provider, French Data Network. It was the whole model that was doomed. Basically, to set up a service on Minitel, you had to ask permission from France Telecom. You had to go to the old guys who ran the system and who knew absolutely nothing about innovation. It meant that nothing new could ever happen. Basically, Minitel innovated from 1978 till 1982, and then it stopped. End quote. Having said that, it is interesting to note that a number of sources report that a large number of French-based internet entrepreneurs got their start and cut their teeth by first developing services for Minitel. Again, since I lack first-hand experience with the Minitel system, I reached out to an avid listener of this podcast to fact-check me on this episode, and then also to share some of his own experiences with the Minitel system. Laurent Bristiel is a Frenchman, a software engineer at ForgeRock, 
And he and I have gotten to be friendly on Twitter. You can follow him at L-A-U-R-E-N-T-B-R-I-S-T-I-E-L on Twitter. And do so. He's an excellent follow. Laurent used Minitel in his youth, and what follows is what he reported back to me from his own anecdotal experiences. Quoting Laurent here, France was, and still is, a very centralized country, and Minitel is a good example of a French state-run project. It was launched by the state using the state-owned telecommunications network and advertised on state-run television. Many people took a Minitel system home because it was free. So initially, the killer app was the white and yellow pages, and they worked as advertised. It was handy, and the service was free. The main issue was that it was really slow, though for a service like white pages, that was not a big issue. The next most used services were serious things, like train ticket booking and banking. This was incredibly handy and modern, to not have to go to the bank, for example, to know when your salary was transferred to your account. Besides that, entertainment-like services, like media-run services and messaging, became bigger and bigger over the years. The media, TV, radio, newspapers, could use their own channels to communicate on their Minitel services, and they did it both because every other competitor was doing it, but also because it could be a source of revenue. You could have news headlines, play games, or participate in polls. For example, a a typical example would be during a competition-like show, like American Idol or So You Think You Can Dance, TV programs where watchers could vote for their favorite competitor by going to 3615-TF1. Another example would be during a soccer game, you could go online to vote for the best player of the game. But all those entertainment things were significantly more expensive than the white pages and the banking-like apps. The last big thing was the Minitel Rose services, places where people could have sexy conversations and or find mates. And these were the things that were heavily advertised in the streets of France. And Minitel to this day is often associated with those services in popular memory. A few more details that Laurent recollects for us. The Minitel system booted in about one second and was never infected by viruses and was essentially never very buggy, so it was quite solid as a system. There were countless stories of people who ended up with hundreds or even thousands of francs in telephone bills at the end of the month, and that was what made some people afraid to take a Minitel system home. They feared not being able to control the price, or feared that their kids would overly play with it. And that led to Minitels often being housed in the adults' or the parents' bedrooms. Many a household had a primary phone line in the living room or hallway, and a secondary one in a more private place, like, again, the parents' bedroom. And the Minitels often ended up in that place because parents wanted to be able to keep them away or monitor children's usage. It turns out that enrolling at university for a time had to be done via Minitel. Apparently, the number was 3615 Ravel. There was simply no other way to apply to higher schooling. And so that was a main motivation for a lot of families to go out to get one. Getting your exam results back quickly obviously was a key motivator as well. According to Laurent, Minitel never really became a real communications device like a phone or an internet. It was too expensive to go on those messaging services with any degree of regularity. And he maintains that Minitel was never actually seen as a knowledge source. There was nothing close to a Wikipedia on Minitel, and so kids in France were not trained to go there to find data for a presentation at school, for example. And so in his mind, the big deal breakers for using Minitel as a knowledge service were the cost concerns as well as the absence of search. Finally, Laurent says when the 3615 kiosk services became big and Minitel became famous in France, it was never really seen as something very serious. 
it was far more associated with the expensive prices as well as the Minitel Rose services. Finally, Laurent disputes this notion that internet penetration in France was slower compared to other European countries, or at least similar ones like the UK or Germany. On the one side, he says, the Minitel system actually caused people to be used to keyboard screen online services, so they were trained to be prepared for when such a service like the web came about. On the other hand, people obviously could say, why do online banking on the internet when I can do it on Minitel? But again, Laurent maintains that things shifted at the end of the 90s in a similar fashion and in similar numbers to other Western European countries. Thank you, Laurent, for your first-hand recollections here. The Minitel service was finally shut down in the summer of 2012. There's a great New York Times article that I'll link to in the show notes about how at the time of the shutdown, approximately 400,000 of the machines were still in use and how older users, as well as rural ones, were still very much attached to the Minitel system, even in the age of smartphones. In many ways, we have to give credit to Minitel for creating the first mass-scale interactive networked online service nearly a decade before the web came about. Minitel was the world's first large database accessible to the public, and as Laurent points out, the Minitel terminal was the first screen and keyboard combination device widely available in any country. And so credit where credit's due, I think we should look back at the Minitel system as a sort of alternate net, a what could have been a successful web before the World Wide Web. Having said that, I think it would be interesting to end this piece with a comment from the French animatrice that Reply All interviewed in their episode. I'll uh, let you listen to that piece right here. As for Jean-Marc, he's a writer now covering tech for Le Monde. He says we shouldn't miss the Minitel. It was too expensive, too limited. Nostalgia for internet's long past? That's an American indulgence. Well, all I can say is, at least in the case of this podcast, guilty as charged. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, and my personal Twitter is at brianmcc. Thanks for listening.